Hello, welcome, and thank you so much for being here today on day 123 of the Income Stream. Today, we are talking about how to interview like a pro. And we're gonna talk about why interviews are important, how to conduct a great interview, who to interview, all these great things and more today here on the Income Stream. If you haven't been here with the show before uh, and, and you're here live with us, say hello to the chat. They're friendly, I promise. If you're here watching the replay, use the comment hashtag team replay to let me know uh, that you're watching the replay and we're gonna have some fun. This is a very, very important topic, especially to me as a podcaster, but whether you're a podcaster or perhaps just a YouTuber or even just doing this for a written interview, this stuff will matter to you. So welcome in, thanks so much. Say hello to everybody who's here and I appreciate you. Let's do this. This is the Income Stream to help you achieve your dream. Oh, while we keep it clean, this is the Income Stream. It's the kind of show where you can come and go, but then you leave inspired with no fear required. The Income Stream with that plan. Morning, y'all. <coughs> wow. I drank my coffee way too fast there. <laughs> I'm a little too excited about this topic. Woo, okay. First of all, <clears throat> promise I'm okay. Just had some coffee a little bit too fast. Uh, <clears throat> give me one second. <clears throat> That's never happened before. Anyway, uh, make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already. And again, I appreciate you so much for being here. Um, if you've conducted interviews yourself in the past, let us know in the chat and if you might go back and remember your very first interview, you might remember that it was quite difficult. Um, it's a little bit nerve wracking. There's a lot of anxiety because you are speaking to a real life person and you're trying to capture this thing so that you can present it again in a way to somebody else in a way that's hopefully gonna help them. And it's hopefully going to uh, inspire people. It's going to motivate people. It's going to inform people. But I wanted to tell you a quick story about my very first interview. And the reason I'm telling you this is because as I always say, you have to be a disaster before you become the master. And although I feel like I've progressed quite a bit, I, I know that there's still things that I can learn, but I wanted to take you back into time so that you feel a little bit better about yourself. So let me tell you a story about my very first interview, and then after that I'm gonna teach you what makes a great interview and how to be a world-class interviewer. Who to interview, how to have the right mindset, types of questions to ask, these sorts of things. <clears throat> Okay, so let me tell you a quick story. And what happened in the camera? I'll just tell it to this camera. Technical issues, throat issues, all good. We're all good today. So my first interview was right after I decided I wanted to start a podcast. This was back in December of 2008. Mind you, my first episode didn't come out until July of 2010. Quite a long time after. And this interview was done in about 2009. And because this was so poor of an interview, I think this was part of the reason why I delayed the launch because I just wasn't sure that I was cut out for a podcast, let alone interviewing. So I interviewed a man named Yaro Starok. Yaro runs a website at entrepreneurs-journey.com and he was kind of a hero of mine. He blogged a lot about how to get started online and a lot of his content was very easily consumable. And when I wanted to start a podcast, he had heard about me and what I did with my architecture website and we decided to, t to chat and I asked him if he could uh, come on my podcast that was coming. He said, sure. So here I was getting ready for my very first interview. I did not have good sound in my office. So I did my podcasting in my, in my office. I mean, a little nook in the corner of my apartment. Um, I did my interview in the closet. A closet is a great place to do interviews because there's some really good soundproofing in there, all the clothes and the carpet. It absorbs a lot of the echo, so it's a great place to go. So I remember being in my closet, I remember connecting with Yaro uh, on Skype, and I just froze. I didn't know what questions to ask. I started shaking, you could hear it in my voice, I was really nervous, and I started just going back to what it was like to do interviews with kids in school. When you're in school and you were like practicing interviewing, I don't know, I did that in class one day. And so I started asking the same questions that I did when I was a kid. I started asking questions to Yarl, this world-class entrepreneur, like, what's your favorite color? And he said, blue. What's your favorite food? Spaghetti. And then of course, me trying to be witty, I was like, okay, so do you like blue spaghetti? Ha 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 ha. It didn't go very well. Uh, luckily, he forgave me 
later on when I met him in person and uh, funnily, funnily enough that interview got lost in a hard drive crash so I don't, I don't know, ever know what happened to it uh, but anyway that's uh, what happened there and so I was very very scared not didn't get off to a good start but the more I went the better it got uh, when I first started my show, it was great because I started learning how to interview with some of my friends first, people who I already had a relationship with. And that's what I would recommend you start out with, people you already have a relationship with before you go and try to hunt for the big celebrities in your space or the A-listers. Try to start working with the people who you already know because you can have a casual conversation with them and that's really key. Now before we get into the specific questions and how to ask those questions and how to be a great interviewer, I do wanna provide some context here. And that's context being your first tip. In order to have a great interview and have it be very well received, we need to understand the context by which this person is going to be on our show. Meaning, what's the purpose of having them on the show in the first place? A lot of times I see entrepreneurs, especially brand new podcasters, we shoot for the moon or we shoot for different people who are perhaps even more accessible just because they're accessible without providing any insight or even understanding of, well, what does this person mean to the audience? What does this person mean? What is their story? How does it actually pay attention? And how does it actually play a role in what the ultimate goals of my audience are? So understanding your audience, what they need help with, and perhaps what's hot in the industry right now or what you're interested in, having some sort of idea of the context by which that person and that interview inserts itself into your brand is absolutely key. Right, it's absolutely key. So this matters because if the person who you bring on the show, even if they're a celebrity, even if they're an A-lister, if it doesn't quite relate to the audience, if there's no context to the goals that your audience has, then you might as well not even do the interview in the first place. It's gonna fall flat, it's gonna be harder to ask questions, it's not going to perform very well. So when it comes to the selection of those who are gonna be on your show, Thinking about the context and how they insert themselves into your stuff based on their knowledge, based on their expertise and authority, based on their stories. That's absolutely key to understand before you even reach out, before you even understand how to connect with this person and what time and what date you're gonna have this interview. Why do they matter? That's number one, okay? And that's a quick one, but that's number one. Number two, we need to have a connection, right? So although we may br be bringing somebody on the show who uh, you know is a, somebody who's re relevant to the audience, we need to have that audience connect to those people. And the reason this is important is because if a person's listening, and although they might have a relevant story, we need to provide some connection to the audience because we want people to root for them. We want the audience to essentially root for the people who we are interviewing. We want people in the audience to feel like there is a version of them in that person. And I'll tell you, I've, I've conducted a ton of interviews. I mean, here is some of the people who have interviewed on the podcast, Michael Hyatt, Shalene Johnson, Tim Ferriss in episode 51, Ramit Sethi, Gary Vaynerchuk, Amy Porterfield, huge names in the entrepreneurial and online business space. Yet, it's interesting because I've interviewed some other people who many people have never heard of before, for example, I have interviewed a couple named Shane and Jocelyn Sams. Anybody know Shane and Jocelyn? Most people who have never heard of them through my show uh, or found them online yet don't know who they are at all. They are two teachers from Kentucky who once listened to my podcast, changed the course of their lives, built resources for their teacher and librarian friends, and have now built a million dollar business. This episode, SPI episode 122 has more downloads than Tim Ferriss's episode and Gary Vaynerchuk's episodes combined. And Gary's been on the show twice. The reason why this show has way more downloads is because there's much more connection to the audience. So there's a lesson here. The lesson is you don't have to interview just the celebrities in your space. If you interview people who are perhaps more at the level of your audience or who were once there not too long ago, it's much easier for your audience to establish a relationship. And these interviews, no matter what questions you ask, because of the nature of who these people are and how connected they are in the storyline to the connections and the storylines of your audience, it's going to perform better. 
it's going to be re-listened to and a person's not gonna feel like, oh, this person has just got, gotten lucky or this person is you know, in the stratosphere and they're too far ahead of where I'm at. There's no way I could be at their level, which is what people say when they hear Tim Ferriss or Gary Vaynerchuk. And to be honest, like they're in their own, they are in their own world. I remember going to Gary's offices one day and seeing 20 people all working for him, legit just for the social media connection, the, the social media channels that he has. So a lot of people go, oh, I wanna be like Gary. I wanna, I should probably post more and grind and hustle like he talks about and like he does. But you don't have 20 people working right outside your home office to produce social media posts and videos for you like he does, right? So this comparison is very difficult versus finding somebody who's perhaps even in your audience or somebody who's gone through a very similar path to the path that you're trying to teach your audience and having that be much more relatable. I'm on mono audio. Am I for real on mono audio? What is the deal, yo? That's weird. That's strange. That has never happened before. Hmm. That's, that's very curious. I'm very curious about that because I have not changed a thing. I like what Malini is saying here. If you cannot resonate with your audience, they are not going to listen. That's absolutely true. Hold on, let me, let me put mute here. Let me unmute, see if that changes anything. Yeah, there was a crackle earlier. Hmm, that's crazy. Okay, well, it's not the end of the world. I promise that I will try and solve this problem on the fly here. Uh, I've been on mono the whole time. Yo, that's crazy. Hmm. All right, let me see if I can change the mic input and then change it back. All right, so this should sound pretty poor right now. And let me go back to road. Okay, maybe that'll fix it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, when, when you tapped a subscribe button, it went into mono. Weird, weird, yo. Huh, okay. Well, hey, you can hear me on your right-hand side. It'll allow for you to listen to the kids on the other side of the ear. Uh, how do we know if the audience is listening when on the live show, et cetera. Uh, well, if you're, if you're doing a, a live interview, for example, um, a great question would be to actually address the audience that's there, even though you don't wanna address necessarily the live audience. Wow, I guess it fixed. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, whatever I just did. So if you were conducting an interview live, right, we wanna make sure that the audience is, is engaged. What's cool is if you address your audience live without mentioning it's a live audience, it'll also feel very relatable to people who listen to it later, right? So if I'm conducting an interview, I can just say things like, hey, and for those of you listening right now, that could mean now live, but it could also mean live people listening later, right? So there's some really cool things that you can do that can allow for some repurposing both on the live and the repurposed episodes after. Anyway, let's keep going here. We're, we are talking about connection right now and how important it is for the person being interviewed to establish a connection to the audience. So when you are interviewing, a lot of times before you get into the tactics and the tips, try to find the connection to your audience so that you can have your audience stick around and feel that there's more of a relationship between them and the person that you're interviewing. Uh, quite easy to do if you select the right person Right, and then they're telling a story and a person listening is like, oh my gosh, I was just there not too long ago. But if you happen to be interviewing somebody who's at a much higher level, then it's really important at the beginning to establish a connection. Even before you actually play the interview, the actual interview, you know how sometimes on a podcast episode or in a blog post, you write a paragraph or in a video, you have like a cut of you talking to the camera first before you go to the interview. It's sort of like the pre-roll before the interview starts. That's a really important place for you to provide a hook. And the hook should have some sort of connection. The reason this interview is important for you to listen to is blank. You wanna be able to answer that. You don't have to necessarily say it in those words, but establishing that connection up front is absolutely key. It's absolutely key. Now, in addition, we need to also surface the juxtaposition, the contrast between where a person once was and then where they are now, right? The contrast, this provides the 
biggest sort of eye-opening parts of the interviews is where they once were to where they are now. And if you were interviewing somebody who is more on the level of your audience, going to the before allows the audience to connect with them with you know, where they're, where they're at now. With somebody who's maybe an, more of an A-lister, providing that contrast allows people to realize that, hey, they were once there too a while back, right? They once also had struggles. That's a big thing about these interviews with A-listers and celebrities and influencers in your space. If you can, as an interviewer, pull out these stories, and stories are where it's at, yo. Stories is exactly what we wanna, we wanna capture. If we could pull out these stories and make these people seem more human, make them seem more relatable, and you create that contrast with where they are now versus where they once were, then that becomes very powerful. The bigger the contrast, the much more impactful the episode will be. Some of the best advice that I can give you is if you happen to be interviewing a student of yours, which I would highly recommend including on your docket, interviewing your own students, people who you've helped create a success story for. This is very Donald Miller story brand like, inviting these people onto your show so that you can feature them as the hero. They are the Luke Skywalker. You are the Yoda, you're the guide. Now when you invite your students on your show, you don't wanna invite them on your show and go, hey, tell me how awesome I am, or tell me why uh, this course that I created for you was helpful. What about it was the most helpful for you? You don't wanna set it up like that because then it just seems like a forced, almost testimonial or sales pitch, right? What you wanna do is ask questions that provide this contrast, like I said, and that's what we're talking about right now, contrast. The contrast between where they were before they learned this information from you to where they are now. And I did this in episode 275 of the Smart Passive Income podcast, where in fact, I interviewed three different podcasting students of mine on one specific episode. And my goal in these episodes was to provide contrast to where they were before they started their podcast and the struggles and the objections that they had. Those are the kinds of things you wanna pull out. What was going through your head when you first decided you wanted to do this? Tell me a bit more about why you think you were nervous about this and what, what you were afraid of, right? That contrast of before, and then having that juxtaposition of what life is like after. I mean, this is sales page 101. These are the kinds of things we insert on sales pages. And in your interviews, you can quote unquote, sell the interview by talking about and sell the content within this interview by highlighting the before and the objections and the struggles to the after, right? This is why when you see infomercials, what do you see? You see the before, the person using the knife and having a hard time and the knife is slip, slipping off the tomato to the after, which is the person who cuts that very thin layer of tomato on that cutting board. Or the weight loss commercial, right? The before person struggling and the after, and, the, and, and they even use like, you know, uh, gray or sepia tone in the before to make it seem even much older and contrasting that with the newer and the brighter smile when, you know, with the, with the pictures after. So this before slash after is really, really key. If your episodes, if your interviews, if your um, videos do not have this contrast, that's where the excitement, that's where the interest lies is within this contrast of before versus after. Again, thanks for the help chat for helping me fix my audio there. That was really key. Next, clarity. So we've talked about we've talked about context, right? Why is this show important? Why is this person I'm interviewing matter to anybody? Like what what does this have to do with what's going on right now? Number two, connection, establishing a connection with the audience. And in the first parts of the interview, having this person tell their story and having them really connect to what it is that the person who's listening is going through. Contrast, really that juxtaposition between where they once were to where they are now. That way we can be motivating, we can be more impactful. Now we need to talk about clarity. Clarity is key. In your job, your role as a world-class interviewer is if you don't understand something, you have to kind of put yourself in the shoes of your audience, right? And you have to play the role of audience. If you don't understand something, your audience, or at least some people in your audience, may not understand it too. It doesn't make you sound dumb. Let me repeat this. It does not make you sound dumb if you ask for clarification, clarif clarification questions, if you ask for clarification. It actually makes you sound like you're actually paying attention to what your audience might need help with. Yo, hey Archer, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. I appreciate you for that. Good to see you here. Hope you have a, uh, have a great day. So we need to have some understanding 
that we need to clarify things. If you don't, if you don't absolutely understand what's going on, you're totally fine to go, well, can you explain that a little bit more for me? I'm not quite clear on exactly what, what happens here. And yes, we've all heard horror stories of people who are interviewing others who are a little bit more aggressive and uh, you know, you might ask for clarification and a person goes, you didn't understand what I just said? Like, come on now. And if you get ever get in that position, you can always deflect it off of yourself and put it back on your audience, right? And you can actually have that be a very great learning moment for the person who you are interviewing to go a little bit deeper or go get a little bit more detailed in some of the answers that are coming further. So there's always a way to deflect that aggressiveness off of you and for the benefit of your audience, if that makes sense. Anyway, clarity is absolutely key. Now, there are some great questions that you can ask to get this clarity, right? And some questions that you can ask that are quite simple are, why? Why questions are probably the most powerful questions you can ask as an interviewer. And even just literally that question, why, in and of itself, that one single word can go a very, very long way in helping to provide a very, very insightful uh, interview full of gold. Because guess what? Gold is layers deep. Yo, Karma, thank you so much for the super chat and the heart, my friend. I appreciate you. I appreciate that. Now, if you play the, as Chris here says, I, I love this. It's definitely cringeworthy uh, when somebody plays the know-it-all, right? When an interviewer seemingly tries to take the spotlight. If you are doing it right, you shouldn't even really be noticed during the interview. The person who you are interviewing should have the spotlight. You are just the guide. You're just kind of clarifying by asking the right questions and why questions are great. You know when like kids are curious and they ask why all the time and we as parents like despise that, we hate that. It's almost like in culture, it's like why, why, why? It's almost like a joke now. The kids keep asking why, why daddy, why, 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 why? Why is the sky blue? Why this, why that? And we're just like, come on, just stop. And then you get to that point where you're like, well, that's just the way it is. And that's not a good answer, right? My parents used to say that to me sometimes when I'd ask a lot of questions. And I don't hate them for this, but I understand why because I'm a parent now too. But, you know, just to kind of cut things off, you go, well, that's just the way it is. Well, if you're doing an interview and you just go, okay, well, I guess that's the way it is. Well, guess what? You've stopped your audience from learning more. And like I said, the goal lies levels deep. If you just get that surface level answer and you move on to the next, well, guess what? Anybody could be the host of the show. It's you and your ability to ask for clarification that provides insight and excitement and entertainment and information to the audience, right? So think about it. Why do kids ask why? Because they want to know, because they want clarity. And I think that we just in our culture now uh, kind of try to avoid being that person who asks why all the time. It's kind of annoying. But when you're an interviewer, this is the best question that you can ask for the person who you are interviewing. So keep asking why, right? The video is crystal clear here. Thanks, fun. Appreciate you. This is a great idea. Making sure the person has the spotlight. Madeline. Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I, I once heard Larry King say to Conan O'Brien on the Conan O'Brien show that if you are talking more than the person that you were interviewing, you're doing it wrong. You're absolutely doing it wrong. The spotlight should not be on you. The spotlight will be on you if you actually have you show up less because people will continue to come back for more, you being the great interviewer. Uh, now, there's a lot of questions that people ask about interviewing related to, well, should I come up with a list of questions beforehand? And, and I want to talk about this because this is, uh, I know, a very common question. Should you have a list of questions that you should have in mind before you actually sit down and have this interview with somebody, whether it's virtual or in person? And my answer is no. A list of questions is something that anybody can ask that person. It's, again, these questions that are follow-ups to these seed questions that are really key. Now, if you wanted to actually have a couple questions in mind to start with just to be the start of the conversation, that's, that's totally fine. However, I would worry. Now, there are people who you will be interviewing who will ask for some of these questions ahead of time because they want to know where you want them to go, right? And in that case, whenever anybody asks me, hey, Pat, can I get a list of questions that you're going to ask me on the podcast or an assistant may ask this on behalf of the person that I'm going to be interviewing, I always say, well, I don't like to come up with questions ahead of time because I like the questions to come up naturally in the conversation that we're going to have. It's going to be a casual conversation, and I'm just going to be very curious about this person and their story, and I'm going to dig as deep as I can to collect some information from my audience about X, Y, and Z. But if they insist, then what I'll do is I'll send a few questions in mind, but I'll always say these will be questions 
in and around the topics that I'll ask about, but likely I will continue to ask further clarification questions after I get answers so that I can unpack exactly what the audience needs to know. And I always, again, deflect it back to the audience so that this person and or their assistant knows why that's the case, right? And so if they then insist after that, well, then I'll send them a list of questions. So I ask, actually go through like three times before I send them a list of questions. But, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I just really don't like listening to episodes where it just seemingly, it's just seemingly like a list of questions. And this is how we conduct interviews to start with because we have a list of questions, right? And we get an answer and then we move on to the next because we're nervous. We're afraid of asking for clarification questions. We're afraid that by asking for clarification, this person might feel like we're not listening on the other end. But again, remember, it's for the benefit of your audience and that gold lies layers deep. So you have to get to that gold. You have to dig deep to get that gold. You have to pan for it. And it takes time and it takes effort, but it takes you asking clarification questions, right? Next, this is the big secret. If you wanna be a world-class interviewer, you need to remain curious. Just be genuinely curious. This is by far the best secret that covers all the things that we've just talked about. How a person's story provides context to your audience. What the big lessons are. What the, uh, you know, if you're curious, then you're gonna ask the right clarification questions. If you're curious, you're gonna get excited about learning more. If you're curious, you're gonna to try to wanna to get it to a point where not just you, but your audience can understand as well. And whenever I get into an interview situation and I'm about to get on a call with somebody, I literally just tell myself, okay, I am curious about this person and how they can help my audience. And that goes a very, very long way because then it doesn't matter. One of the hardest questions or one of the hardest things to do as an interviewer is in fact to listen. Listening is one of the hardest things to do when you're interviewing, especially if you're just starting out. And it might sound silly because of course you are listening and you're, you're having a conversation with somebody, but to be honest, you're not always 100% there, especially when that red record button is blinking. And if that red record button is blinking, sometimes people just freeze. And I used to do that too. And you just start defaulting to just random questions or things that aren't really in alignment. But if you just go always back to just being curious, then that will guide you all the way through. So be curious. Question from Building a Bassoonist. Is it a good idea to collect questions ahead of time from your audience? And if so, do you send those to the guest ahead of time? Um, I think it's a smart idea to if you in fact had a person that you knew was gonna be very beneficial to your audience to collect questions from your audience ahead of time. There could be even a particular segment where uh, within your show you ask these kinds of questions and you can even let the person know on the other end, like, hey, we uh, had a lot of people excited in the audience and we wanted to poll them and ask a few questions. And here's a question from, uh, you know, Natalie, who uh, she has this business and um, here's her question. And I think it also not just provides context for the person who you were interviewing, but it also shows your audience that you are listening and you're engaging with them, right? When you can get your audience to participate and get involved, they will invest. So that is even something that can be very compelling to mention up front in an episode. Hey, in this episode, I interview so-and-so and on uh, and within our Facebook group, we asked a few of you for some questions. We got some great questions. So stick around to the end so you can hear some of your fellow community members ask questions on your behalf and whatnot. And again, this is a nice sticking point and a hook to get people in. Now, I do wanna talk about sort of the episode structure itself and creating a hook and how you might segment this uh, episode in a way that gets people excited and listening all the way through. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you have any more questions sort of about what we've talked about right now, uh, please feel free to ask and type in the word question in all caps followed by the word question or followed by your question so I can more easily find it. Francis says, I can totally relate. I talked way too much on the episodes I've recorded. Yes, it's so easy to, especially if you know something about these things that, that this person's talking about, it can be very, very easy to feel compelled to tell a story of your own about this. Uh, it can be very easy for you to start teaching on top of what the person is saying. But again, I would try to focus in on asking more questions and doing more telling. Remember, part of the secret here is to be curious and try to become somebody who's trying to be less interesting and try to get more interested. The more interested you can get, the less interesting you're trying to be, the more the focus is on the person who is actually on the show being interviewed, and therefore the more 
uh, relevance there is uh, to the audience there. Great episode. Thank you. Great thing to do on YouTube as well. Yes, for sure. I will talk if I am slightly losing my thought and trying to get my next question. Ramble, I hate that. Yes, this just comes with practice. The idea, and I love that you mentioned this, Share. Thank you for being so open and honest here. I do the same thing too. When I am lost, I will often just kind of talk and maybe ramble a little bit. It's not really anything that's valuable. Um, and that's going to happen, right? And the more that you interview, the more likely that you're going to get yourself out of that. And you'll have the idea of you're just in the moment with that person and be able to have sort of a question ready to fire off as soon as that person talks. And again, you know, if you were in a coffee shop with this person and you were just having a conversation, you know, number one, you're not going to come with a list of questions typically unless like you're a journalist or something asking questions in that manner. Number two, um, you're likely to have more of a natural conversation where you aren't fishing for questions. You're just there and present with them and curious. And this is why this idea of um, – Curiosity is really key. The idea of just, you know, you just trying to want to understand more. And if you are curious as a person is talking, you can already begin to understand what questions you might follow up with. Now, I will say that I do take notes during my interviews, but I just take bullet point notes about topics that I don't want to make uh, that I want to make sure I don't pass up or I write down things that I'm not quite sure about so that I can go back and ask questions later. Um, the big and hard thing about this is you want people to talk. You want the person that you are interviewing to continue moving forward and talk. But at the same time, they might be talking a lot and things that were once spoken about that have sort of been moved on from already that needed clarification, you've sort of moved on. So this is why I have notes about certain things that I take um, that I'm interviewing somebody about so that in case we move forward from that, in that person's answer, you know, they're rambling, they're telling a story. I can go, okay, well, you know, let me go back to when you said this. There was something that you mentioned that I wanted to ask for more clarification about because I think that's a really important thing that all of us should need to learn more about. So what was going through your head when blank? And I love that question too. What was going through your head when blank, right? I also think another important thing to do as a world-class interviewer is to understand that a person that you are interviewing often will stop talking because they don't want to be rude, right? A person might just answer the question and then stop because they're gonna wait for your next question. And that's a very classical way of interviews just being done. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. One thing that you could do is essentially just give permission to that person to keep going because they're gonna they're gonna pause to see if you have anything to say or wanna go a different direction. But oftentimes during these interviews, sometimes you can just go, well, keep going, what happened next, right? Tell that person to keep going deeper and they will keep going deeper, right? It's essentially them just checking in with you and you just going, no, 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 keep going. I, I, I like where that was headed. So see how you might be able to, as you are doing interviews, to see if, again, this person is just telling a story and they're not quite at the finish line yet. Well, have them keep going and if, in fact, you don't have anything that you need clarification from. Uh, and, and that's a very smart way to continue that story, right? The stories is, is where it's at. It, there's a little trick I learned from Alex Bloomberg. Uh, if you want to collect a story from somebody, right? If you're talking about a particular topic and you're just curious about how something might have happened for somebody, um, a great and easy strategy to have and pull out the story from the person you're interviewing is to set it up and essentially give them permission to tell that story by saying something like, well, tell me about a time when blank. Tell me about a time when you were doing a live stream and something technical happened that, that was unexpected. Oh, okay, well, I remember... I think it was on day 123. I didn't realize this, but the chat was telling me that the audio was coming out from just the right-hand side and I didn't know what to do, but I tried to problem, you know, I, then I can get into the story. And when, it's funny, because when you tell a person, well, tell me about a time when blank, now this person's not in answering questions on an interview mode, they're now in storytelling mode and they can better create that description of what was happening. And again, having this be contextual within the topics of interest to your audience is key, but these stories are where it's at. These stories are what is relatable. The stories are what is remembered. These stories are what people will um, you know, use as definition for, for these people, right? A lot of people know my story because got laid off, started this uh, business in the architecture space and you know was able to come out of that even better. And this story has been absolutely key in, in my journey with making connections with people and having people understand 
that I'm not just a person who is just a random person who started talking about making money online. I had my own business and I started out just like everybody else too. And my story is now even becoming even more relevant during this time. And so pulling out these stories is really key. And I love that trick. Big shout out to Alex Bloomberg, who was the founder of the startup podcast, as well as Gimlet Media. Congrats to them for their buyout from Spotify. Um, just an amazing story. But uh, that was a trick that he's used and he has taught uh, those of us. I remember watching him on a Creative Live once. Creative Live is a brand that has these experts come in to teach and he taught podcasting and um, interviewing. Um, I'm always trying to become a better interviewer. I, I study it. I watch interviews. I write down notes. I pay attention to how I can always become a better interviewer. And it's just practice, right? Practice and being conscious about what you can do to become a better interviewer is, is key. And you'll eventually get to the point where it's almost automatic, right? The questions that you ask, you don't even have to think about them ahead of time. They just naturally come out. Um, the way by which you set up these stories for your audience, uh, the way that you collect these stories, um, and it, 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 just, it just comes over time. So if you're starting out and you're about to start your first interview, um, just remember, be curious more than anything. Be genuinely curious, and that will guide you more than anything. So I'd love to, to spend the last 23 minutes here answering questions about interviewing, uh, and we can even get into some of the for more finer details of that if you choose to. I do want to talk also about how to set this up in the episode structurally. So in interviews, uh, there are two different ways that you could probably set this up. Number one, at the beginning of your show, and again, I'm talking about the hook. As a podcaster, you have about a minute to create a hook for a person to capture their attention, to have them put that phone in their pocket so that they'll, you know, start doing the dishes or start their run or start their commute, right? And then, and then you've got them. If you're doing an interview and it's for a YouTube channel, you have to hit them a little harder. And you only got about 10 seconds to really convince a person why they need to stick around and listen to this, especially if they're listening because, it, you know, if they're a subscriber to you, well, now you're telling people, hey, you're not listening to me in this episode, you're listening to this other person. We really need to sell it up front. And on the blog post, it's that first paragraph, having that be a connection and relatable and why this person matters, context to what it is that their goals are, is really key to share in that first paragraph alone. Uh, the title and the headlines, like these are really important too, but there's a couple ways to do this. You can just kind of get right into the interview with that context in mind and with that relevance to the person who is gonna be watching, reading, or listening to this. Or, especially if it's a video format or a podcast format, you can pull parts of the interview out from the middle that are quite interesting, that are very curiosity-driven, that create what's called an open loop. An open loop is something that you might see and notice if you watch any sort of Netflix shows or you watch a television show. You know, they pull out a part from the middle of that episode that opens up a loop and it's like, oh my gosh, I have to know what happens next or I have to figure out what that means. And then thus you stick around and you're interested in, in, in listening all the way through, right? Or watching all the way through. You can do that with your interviews. It's just really important that you take a snippet that's maybe 15 to 20 seconds, no longer than that, because if it's longer than that and you legit start out with that, it can provide a little bit of, I don't know, I've noticed that if, a, if an episode starts with a clip from the middle, essentially in the beginning, right, to create that hook, if it's any longer than 20 seconds, you almost feel like, hey, did I like start this episode midway through? Like, I, what's the context of this, right? I think providing some sort of drama, dramatic or, or sort of insightful moment in the beginning is key, but you have to pop in and go, okay, well, here's what you're listening to and why this is important and make sure you stick around, right? Especially if it's an open loop. Uh, we don't want to have people come in and go, well, did I start this episode halfway through? I don't know what the deal is. Uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. I just saw that come in. Uh, you're amazing. Super chat. Hi, Pat. Great topic, especially as I'm from the radio industry. Always taught two ears versus one mouth for that reason. Listen more than ask. Thanks for you. Do. Great. Thank you for sort of verifying the kinds of things we're talking about here, especially as somebody who is in the radio industry and has done this probably for longer than me. But uh, that that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um and yeah, I mean, you can watch and listen to other people with intention of learning and get better as well. That's the other thing, uh, whether it's watching Oprah or Larry King or um, Barbara Walters, you know, those are like the high level interviewers, the ones who are very much in the bigger uh, sort of mainstream spotlight to interviews on podcasts that you enjoy and that you love and considering, okay, well, why do I like this interview? What are they doing to have it be more compelling than somebody else who might just have this person on the show and ask surface level questions, right? 
Philip says, hi, Pat. Good morning. Glad to join in. Keep sharing. Have a profitable uh, day. Phil. What's up, Phil? Glad you're here. Thank you. And all the way from India, too. That's amazing. How do you handle who unsubs from your list? Uh, my Says my sassy entrepreneur. Um, seeing unsubscribes from your list can be very depressing, right? Because you're working really hard. You're creating these messages. You send an email out, and then you, you see some, pe you, some people unsubscribe. It can be very deflating, especially if you're just starting out. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about that uh, because what to me that is doing is now, of course, if you share an email and you have like a, an absorbent amount of unsubscribes, well, then pay attention to, well, what perhaps did you say in that email so that the next time you send an email, you don't say the same things that might, you know, have an above average amount of unsubscribes. But over time, you're going to know that in every email you send, you're going to have people unsubscribe. But the way that I reframe my mind around that is, well, hey, every time I send an email and I get unsubscribes, I'm making my email list stronger. The people who do open those emails, who do click through, who do stick around are that much more likely to stick around even more. And know that if a person unsubscribes now, it doesn't mean they're unsubscribed forever. They might come back for something else uh, and come back even stronger. So I try not to let it weigh so much on my head because it used to do that. And sometimes people have different kinds of reasons for unsubscribing. Maybe they just are trying to clean up their inbox. And um, and 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 I you know you know I would I would use that opportunity to go okay well how can I improve my emails always but don't get so bogged down about that. Had to walk away. Was there another step after curiosity? No, we're sort of in Q and A mode now, Romer. So no worries about that. I'll be brave. Question: When would you like to be on the Calming Anxiety podcast? Thanks, Martin. Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, since you're in pro, send me a direct message in SPI Pro, and we'll we'll talk about that. How do you, uh, let's see. Question, newbie here. My podcast launched this week. Do you compensate the person you are interviewing? Uh, great question, Linda. Typically, the answer is monetarily, no. Um, you want to try and reward this person and thank them for coming on your show as much as possible. But typically, there is no monetary exchange. Uh, sometimes that's the case. I mean, sometimes you might have to pay to get access to people. But... In my 10 years of doing podcasts, I've never paid a person to come on my show. And honestly, if they wanted to pay me, uh, it, or if, if they wanted me to pay them, I would say no. I would say no. So the way compensation might work is, well, they're getting this exposure onto your brand. You're hopefully conducting this interview in a way that puts them in a really good spotlight. You're going to share it. It's going to be a part of your archive. You're going to promote it and all these kinds of things. That in and of itself can be enough compensation but um, typically, that's not a part of the conversation. Hey, yeah, I'd love to be on your show, but what are you going to do for me? Um, I think that, you know, obviously, depending on how long your show's been around and how many listeners you have, you can attract bigger people, the bigger that your audience is. Um, so don't get so deflated if you can't reach those A-listers quite yet. Remember, you can interview your own students and your own audience. Those are very relatable to other members of your community, and it can help heighten the community in and of itself and connect with other podcasters and people who are at the same level as you, other YouTubers, because these collaborations go a long way and you can kind of grow and share audiences together. What do you do when the person being interviewed totally sidetracks you to what you wanted to ask? Well, having that North Star in that episode is really key, right, Bernard? So understanding where eventually you want a person to go is, is key and ultimately where you want them to land. However... There's many times where a person that you're interviewing gets sidetracked and can go sort of this direction. And I think it's important to sort of, A, like don't stop them as they're talking, but get to a stopping point where then you can go, okay, let's steer the ship back over here, right? Sometimes a person might get sidetracked and they'll, and they'll actually end up in a space that's like, wow, I didn't know we were gonna end up here, but let's go there because this is awesome and this is where their energy is at. So let's actually go there. And it's gonna be up to you to decide whether or not you wanna go there or come back because it obviously is, is going to relate back to your audience and how they sort of uh, pay attention to it. And again, just use your curiosity to, to guide you there. Pat Flynn, I dare to try a new hook that you suggested, and I think it's going to work well. Thank you for calling us higher. You're welcome. Question, how do you, uh, we talked about that already. Uh, let's see. When you pick someone as your guest, be sure you are not inviting them just to have the warm body to interview. Pick someone you're already excited about interviewing. I like that, interviewing, getting on the inside of that. Tiffany says, if you're interviewing somebody and there's a chance the podcast, including their interview, will end up in a book, do you have to pay them? What should you do in that situation? Well, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, um, in most cases, you won't have to pay them. 
Uh, that again is something that um, is 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 very rare. Um, although it could potentially happen. Uh, number two, you could up front ask a person to either sign a contract or to agree that you're able to use this content in your podcast, on your videos, and perhaps even repurposed as other products. Um, however, in most cases, if this is something that you've done ahead of time, like a podcast, and then you have this idea to turn it or put it into something that's more of a paid product, sometimes just simply reaching out to this person and letting them know this is what you're doing and that you're gonna do what you can to also promote it and help them and mention them in that in that book or what have you too, that can often be enough. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't come across as, hey, now you're just using my stuff to make more money for you. Um, I think that as a podcast grows, a person who just, you know, can understand that sometimes, well, this means it's even gonna be found by even more people. So there is still something in it for them, despite that happening. Um, always being honest, don't let it be a surprise. And I like being upfront, because sometimes people are gonna go, you know what, I'm not comfortable, or I didn't agree with that. Um, please don't use it on in your book. In which case, you can either try to come up with a deal or, or, or try to work out something, or leave that person out without having gotten in trouble later. Best practice for equipment to do interviews, live and virtual. So I would highly recommend that, obviously, if you're gonna do interviews, you wanna make sure you capture these interviews in the best format and also the best quality possible. When it comes to physical equipment, having a really good microphone is really key. I have a lot of microphones and a beginner podcasting kit that you can find at kit.co slash Pat Flynn. If you go to kit.co slash Pat Flynn, in fact, I'll go there now for you. Kit.co slash Pat Flynn. This will take you to a number of tools. These are affiliate links. Uh, but there is a podcasting kit that you can use. There's me and my son. We actually tested this while in Hawaii a couple years back, and this was really cool. Is this asking me for cookies? That's is that why it's not going? Yeah, okay, that was blocked. So this podcasting kit is one that you can choose to use if you're on the go, which is really great. Good for your iPhone and Android as well. Uh, but this is the podcasting mic, the Samson Q2U, and some of the things that you can uh, use with that to conduct some really high quality audio for yourself. Now, when it comes to the audio quality of the person that you are interviewing, please know that their audio quality does not have to be world-class or professional. Now, if obviously they have a good microphone, then that's better. The better the sound quality, obviously, the better the interview sounds. But it's less expected that the person that you are interviewing has a good uh, audio quality. You need to have good audio quality. Your guest does not have to have that as much. Uh, but like I said, if that's possible, then awesome, but it's not required. If you think about a radio show, you hear the DJ and they have this beautiful, deep voice, it's resonant, and then they call in or somebody somebody calls in and it's their cell phone. We never go, oh, the audio quality of that cell phone is bad. I've actually conducted interviews for my podcast, the Smart Passive Income podcast, and uh, the person on the other end was on their phone because they couldn't make it home in time, but they had a meeting after, so they pulled over on the side of the road and they just called in um, and we connected because on Skype you could call in or on other, uh, you know, there's now apps and stuff uh, that, that you can do this with. Uh, it sounds fine. It's, it, it sounded fine. Nobody ever complained. As long as your audio quality is good, that's what matters most. But when it comes to the interview software, right, there's a couple ways to go about this. You can use free things like Zoom or Skype, but the audio quality will degrade because those, are, those things are being compressed as they are coming in. And so it's not going to sound as great uh, as it would if you were to use a tool that's meant specifically for conducting these audio interviews. And the one that I would recommend is called Squad cast let me say that one more time squad cast if you go to smartpassiveincome.com slash squad cast this is an affiliate link by the way this will take you to squad cast and that is my affiliate link and this is studio quality podcast from anywhere the way that this works it's very similar to zencaster except it has a lot more features and, and it breaks a lot less um is it when you get on in, a, in an interview situation with somebody what happens is actually, you know, I can, it'll, just let me tell you how it works first. It records the audio locally on both sides. And then as this is being done, you're actually getting the interview uploaded to you in the most raw form possible so that by the time the interview ends, it's essentially ready to go and download. It downloads in separate tracks, or you can even mix those tracks right then and there. And it sounds absolutely fantastic. What I love about this is you just send a person a link. There's no, there's no software or anything this person has to download like on Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever. It's literally browser-based and the experience is really great. It also is really uh, fantastic for helping you even schedule uh, these interviews. Let me see if I can log in here really quick and show you what the interface 
looks like. I'm going to log in here really quick for you. I indeed can remember what my password is. Okay, so here's what the interface looks like, which is really cool. So you get this reusable session, which is just sort of like a Zoom room that you can use anytime, but you can actually schedule these ahead of time, which is really cool. These are interviews that are that are coming up uh, for Ask Pat, which is really cool. These are interviews that I've done before. And what's really cool is if I want to create a new one, I can add a session. I can name it interview with XYZ. I can put a date and a time to it. I can put my email and I can put the guests emails and this will automatically help them. It'll, they'll get an email with the link and all that stuff. It's automatically sent to them. And then what's really cool, like I said, is a lot of these things will already include the audio files in WAV format or I can click both of these things and get the mix of the recording so that they're both combined in one episode. And again, there's backups. It's just super fantastic. It's so easy to use. And when a person joins the room, let's see, if I were to join a room, I'll show you what the green room looks like. This is what it looks like, right? Now it's likely loading here because I'm using video during the live stream. It does pull video and they don't yet have a uh, live video to record but it shows the live video so that, oh, there we go. Hey everybody. So this actually will show video even though it's recording the audio only. And the reason is because a lot of people choose to, you can turn it off, you can have it off by default, but you can choose to have a conversation face-to-face -to -face with somebody and record that audio because sometimes people feel it's more natural if you see the cues from somebody and you're watching and talking to a person face-to-face, -face, it provides for a better audio interview. They are working on actually being able to record the video as well but it has echo cancellation. It actually checks to see if your internet is fast enough and you can choose these things. And this is what a person who you send a link to sees on the other end as well. And if I were to hit join session here, let's see if it'll do this. Whoa, quite big. But anyway, I can copy this link and then send it to somebody and, um, and that will allow us to connect there. Now I'm gonna turn this off and I'm not gonna hit record, which I could do below here, but it's super simple to use. Anyway, uh, super stoked on sharing Squadcast. I am, in full disclosure, an advisor to Squadcast, so just keep that in mind. Um, maybe it's a little bit biased because I actually am a part of that company. But anyway, uh, I'm excited for that for sure. Let's see, did I screw up my... Looks like I'm zoomed in a little bit now. That's fine. There, we oh, it looks like it's a different resolution now which is fine, we can chat here for a little bit. Uh, anyway, uh, Squadcast is, is really great. And let's see if there's any more questions to answer here from a lot, a lot of people. Can you have multiple people on Squadcast? Yes. Let's see, I had scheduled an interview this week, been scheduled for three months. They called from car at night, driving in the dark. I said, we can reschedule and just went live and uh, promoted my next schedule show, says Dole Whip Dad. Sorry, I'm just looking for questions here. I've used Zoom three times and it's terrible. The audio delays from the video because the audio is recording at 32 instead of somewhat standard 44.1. I'm looking for a new software program. Great, well maybe Squadcast could be an answer for you for sure. Uh, what is this called? Squadcast. Again, my affiliate link for that is smartpassiveincome.com slash squad, S-Q-U-A-D, cast, C-A-S-T. Can Squadcast handle phone conversations? Um, you can send a person a link and they'll be able to join, but it is not phone right now. They don't use Apple, so it's not good if you have a Mac computer. Um, let's see, question. Can I use Squadcast on a Mac? Will it record video? Uh, it will record video soon, but it is, yes, um, you do have the ability to use this on a Mac for sure. All right, uh, let's see. Other questions coming in about interviews just in general. Pat, thanks for my uh, the answer. My idea was to let them know up front and let them know they'll be heavily promoted. Also, they get affiliate status automatically if they help sell the book. Cool, yeah, I mean, that's a value to the person that you're interviewing, so that's totally fine. Question, how do you politely tell someone who contacts you that they are not a good fit for your audience without completely burning bridges? Um, you know, I love being authentic and honest with people, and I think that, you know, it's much better to be honest and upfront versus just kind of 
you know, beating around the bush or leading this person on, right? I think it's important for them to have an answer up front versus sort of just waiting around and knowing. And I think that just, you know, using, you know, you can message, you can message them and just saying very, very politely, you know, hey, thank you so much. Um, and, and actually, here's what I do because we get asked so, so often and I don't want to burn these bridges either is I'll say, hey, we have scheduled the next several months of interviews already. I'll put you down on a list of potential people to interview. And uh, if the time is right, I might reach out to you in the future if the topic fits. But for right now, I'm unable to do this interview uh, in, in, in the current lineup. But again, should uh, the topic, uh, and should the topic arrive, you know, I have it written somewhere, but I, I can't pull it out in time probably. But you see what I'm, what I'm saying? Like there are ways to sort of soften the blow if that makes sense. So, hey, I already have a lineup uh, for the near future. So that would deflate, okay, well, I want to get interviewed right now. Well, okay, well, what are they going to say? No, insert me in before anybody else who you, you've already planned. They're not going to do that. Uh, and then secondly, hey, I'll add you to a list of names. And we have, you know, several people on that list already who I will contact should the topic and the timing make sense uh, in the future. But for right now, I'm going to have to politely decline. So that that way it's 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 more polite. You're letting person you're letting people know essentially that, well, it's, it's, it's a no for right now. Um, and in many cases that, that, that's enough, that that's enough. Question. We'll be celebrating our 50th episode soon. And I want to collect fan messages for our big show. Is there a tool you recommend? Yes. I highly recommend checking out this tool that I'm about to share with you here. It's called speakpipe.com. What's really cool about speakpipe.com is that allows you to record voice messages really easily, super easy. And essentially what, it, what this looks like for a person is if you go to speakpipe.com slash Pat Flynn, uh, this is the link we send people. And essentially they just get a link, even if it's on their mobile device, they hit record. And when they are finished recording, you get this as an MP3 file. And this is really, really easy for you to then drag and drop and put into your own timeline for your podcast, which is really cool. Question, is there a respectable, is there a respectable open rate? Yeah, why is the camera being all funky right now? It's so strange. Uh, so we keep pressing buttons and, and ruining things, but that's okay. Is there a respectable open rate for emails? I've been getting about 25 to 30%, but got 70% on Mother's Day. Don't know how to recreate better percentage. Um, I would look at the emails that have a higher percentage open rate and look to see what the patterns were. It all has to do with the timing and the subject line. What's within the emails matters very small. Now, obviously, if you send emails and there's a lot of trigger words in there, there's a lot of words that you don't want to use in emails like, you know, um, I mean, if you look up on Google, there's a whole list of words that you don't want to use in emails because that can lower your deliverability. Uh, especially in subject lines, like discount uh, is one of them, for example. Uh, but uh, the title is probably what has a lot to do with it and the timing of it. So see in your archive of emails which ones perform better and just do more of that, if that makes sense. But yeah, 25 to 30% is actually a little bit higher than standard, which is great. Good job. Uh, a couple more minutes here, and then we'll finish up. Uh, Zenia and Vlada says, how do you get an advisor for a company, do, you, do they approach you like, hey, wanna be an advisor or how does this happen? Or how do you get to be an advisor for a company? So I'm an advisor for a number of companies, Teachable, uh, ConvertKit, Samcart, Leadpages, Squadcast, and ListenApp. So that's six different companies now, which is really cool. And the big idea is that in exchange for a, a small percentage of the company, I can come on as an advisor to provide advice, to um, provide insight, to uh, help influence decisions, to even help share more than I would normally in, in a regular company that product and help with its growth trajectory. And the big idea being, you know, hey, maybe one day these companies will sell and me owning a percentage of that company, you know, it can go very well. Um, for full disclosure, I am an advisor for Teachable. Teachable recently got bought out for, you know, uh, more than a couple hundred million dollars. And even though I, um, you know, and, and I got a nice little, you know, check as a result of that, which is really cool. I can't fully disclose the amount, but it wasn't insignificant. But of course, when you're talking fractions of a percentage or what's otherwise known as points in the startup space, 
um, that, you know, it's still significant, but, you know, big ups to the people who founded that company who, who, who made off very, very well. Uh, how do you get to become an advisor for a company? Number one, obviously having a little bit of influence and having some sort of ability to, you know, make growth happen in that business uh, is really key. Uh, number two, having some sort of specialty or talent can go a very long way because a company might want to take advantage or use or utilize that talent. And number three, it's all about relationships. Honestly, all of these companies, none of them were randos that reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to be an advisor? Um, they were all people who I'd once known before who were working on things, who knew that I had some value to offer, who reached out to me, we had a conversation. Two of them were ones where I suggested that, hey, you know, I have these advisorship roles and responsibilities with these other companies. Might there be a position on your board um, or a way for me to be an advisor for your company? And in and, and both cases, uh, in that regard, they said yes as well, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of the next step. Once you get to a point where you build influences, you can now influence other companies and be a, be a sort of brand ambassador in that way. And it's, it's pretty cool. like what Dole Whip Dad uh, here says, provide massive value so as people need you, right? You want to be indispensable, right? That's sort of the key word uh, here. Um, even if you're an employee at a job, how might you become indispensable so that even if people are getting let go, you yourself don't get let go? Uh, be become indispensable, right? So anyway, uh, team, thank you so much for being here today. We talked a lot about interviews and just to recap sort of what we talked about specifically, you know, how to interview like a pro. First, providing context and understanding the context for this person who's on the show, right? Like, why are they there? What do you ultimately want them to help share and inspire and motivate or educate your audience with? And if it's just a random person that you're interviewing and there's no really relation to, uh, you know, the purpose of your show and what it is there for, um, then it's going to seem very out of place and uh, it's not going to make a connection with your audience. Now, when I say connection in this sense, it's pulling out the story such that your audience who's listening can go, oh, I like this person, or I'm rooting for this person, or I um, I can absolutely relate to what's going on right now, that connection and pulling out that, especially for a celebrity, having them become more relatable is actually key. Next, providing contrast, where they once were to where they are now, and having them very, very, under, very much understand uh, that there was a big change and sort of what happened in and around that change, getting into the psyche of that person related to that change, the before and the after, that goes a very long way in creating a very impactful show. Then providing clarity, right? If you're not clear on something, your audience, if you're not sure about something that your interview were, interviewee said, then ask for clarification. It's okay to ask why, it's okay to go deeper, it's okay to try to have a full understanding of something. That's actually your job as a person doing interviews, to have clarity and to provide clarity there too. And then finally, curiosity. The best tip I can offer you is to leave here with the idea of the next time you do an interview, whether it's on text, in a video, or in an audio podcast, be genuinely curious. That's going to help you very, very much understand how um, to, to route that interview, what questions to ask, and to better connect with that audience too. So, hey, Team Flynn, thank you so much. I appreciate you. You are amazing. Uh, hook me up with a thumbs up if you enjoyed this episode and I just want to encourage you as you move forward and it can be very nerve wracking. It can be very scary to do an interview, but hopefully with these things in mind, you're that much more prepared and again, be genuinely curious. It's going to help guide you along the way too. And Hey, you're going to mess up. You're going to get it wrong. Just make sure number one, you hit record. I've done interviews before where after an hour, I realized I forgot to hit record just because I was so excited. So make sure you hit record. Number two, make sure that you have the audio input, the correct audio input, one time I plugged in my webcam and as a result, the computer changed the audio input to the uh, speaker and microphone that was on the webcam. And I conducted the 35, 45 minute interview all with the webcam microphone, which obviously is not gonna sound as good as my podcasting or uh, dynamic or condenser microphone. Uh, and then finally, just have fun with it, right? You're in there, you're interviewing, be in that moment, be curious, have a conversation, try to learn more and your audience, a fly on the wall will benefit as a result. So, hey, y'all, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, I know a lot of you are doing interviews right now, and I would just want to just keep pushing you forward. And for those of you who are still a little bit scared, try it with somebody that you already have a relationship first so that it's a little bit easier up front. Then you can move on to people who you don't know and have them be great too. So, hey, everybody, well done. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Take care. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. This is the income stream to help you.
help you achieve your dream Oh, while we keep it clean This is the income stream It's the kind of show Where you can come and go But then you leave inspired With no fee required The income stream With Pat Flynn Hey, have a great day It's a new week New opportunities New motivation um, Just be awesome You're awesome Thanks for being here Come back tomorrow Right here 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. Peace out, y'all. Bruh.